All right, so here we are. We're going to talk about the thyroid gland. It's an incredibly important gland in the body. It's located in the throat. It has two lobes. It's connected in the middle by a little structure called the isthmus. Um, and uh, its its structure is that it has these large um, spherical structures called follicles that are the manufacturing sites for thyroid hormone. And uh, uh, what we see in there is this glycoprotein called thyroglobin, and it plays a role in uh, the manufacturing of thyroid hormone. So let's take a look at that. So within these follicles, you're going to have a fluid called colloid in there. Now the word colloid means that you have um, a fluid with big chunky particles suspended in it. That's all that really means. There's no magic that you can interpret from colloid, colloid other than it's a fluid of some sort that has big chunky particles in it. And in this case, we have um, thyro, thyroglobin um, particles as well as the hormone that's being produced and some iodine. So that's what we have in this fluid in these follicles. Now, outside of the follicles, we're going to have some other cells called the parafollicular parafollicular cells, para meaning outside or on the outside of or around, and these cells are going to be doing something different. These cells are going to be producing another hormone that's produced by the, the thyroid gland called calcitonin. So on this slide, let me show you. Uh, here is our thyroid gland right here, and it's wrapped around our windpipe right there just underneath the voice box right there and uh, here's the arch of the aorta so that kind of gives you an idea of roughly where it's located it's located in the throat like midway in the throat mm, yeah midway kind of lowish on the in the throat now what we have here is a slide of some thyroid tissue and what you see here are the big follicle cells and in, inside there is the colloid and we could even see some stuff here in these other uh, follicles and then outside of it we've got these little cluster of cells these are the parafollicular cells parafollicular cells are going to be producing calcitonin and calcitonin as the name kind of implies is going to have something to do with calcium it's going to be these cells that are going to cause calcium to be deposited in bones. So we like these uh, these parafollicular cells. They, they, they release a hormone that helps our bones stay strong. We like that. But we also like these follicular cells because they're producing thyroid hormone, which basically causes all the cells to do their various processes in the bodies. So we really like the thyroid gland. It does a lot of good stuff for us. So thyroid hormone is a major hormone that's going, that's going to drive all the cells to do their various metabolic processes. Now keeping in mind that these processes are going to be um, both catabolic, they could be catabolic where something is being broken down, or it could be anabolic where something is being made. So it's all of those processes. Now when we think about thyroid hormone, it's going to be released into the body in two forms. One is called T3 and the other one is called T4. Now T3 has three iodines uh, attached to it. T4 has four iodines attached to it. T3 is the one that is, um, is biologically active. T4 is the one that could be biologically active as long as you remove that fourth iodine. So that's what's <laughs> that's what's happening there. So yeah, I kind of pause to let let that kind of sink in. So this is an example of where Mother Nature says this is really important. This thing right here is really important. So we're going to release one version of it ready to go, and then we're going to release another version of it that's almost ready to go. That the cells and the body, when it needs it, can just pluck the almost ready version out of the body and then cleave off that third, uh, that fourth iodine, and turn it into the the active T3. So that's, that's, this is an example of that. We're going to see a few examples of that as we study um, in this particular 
uh, term, but this is an example of that. So the body releases two versions, one that's ready to go, one that's almost ready to go, but it's really easy for the cells to convert into the ready to go um, version just by cleaving off that, that fourth iodine. So that's why we have two different types of circulating uh, thyroid hormones. Now, unlike many other hormones, virtually every cell in the body has a receptor for thyroid hormone. That's how important thyroid hormone is. It, it's, it basically, basically is the hormone that goes up to every cell and says, hey, it's, it's okay, do your job. All right, gotcha. It's time to do your job now. Got it. Now keep in mind, thyroid hormone, even though it is a protein-based hormone, uh, an amino acid-based hormone, it's going to be the one that behaves like a steroid. So it's not going to be landing on the surface, a receptor on the surface of the cell. It's going to pass through the, the plasma membrane and find its receptor somewhere in the cytoplasm of the cell. Okay, and then it's going to be able to go into the cell's nucleus just like a steroid and then um, basically do some sort of transcription of metabolic genes in that cell. So now we're talking a lot like it's a steroid, but it's actually a protein-based hormone. It's just configured so that it can behave like a steroid. So what is it that the steroid is doing for us? Well, um, it's doing things like increasing our metabolic rate. It's also responsible for heat generation. And because of these two effects, we would call it um, calorigenic effect. Now, when you don't have enough thyroid hormone, um, it becomes obvious because a person isn't using their uh, isn't, isn't using their fuel sources to make energy, um, and a lot of that gets stored as fat. So people that have low thyroid have a tendency to gain weight uh, and gain weight easily. The other thing is, is that they have trouble um, modulating their body temperatures because they don't have this heat production ability. Um, they also have trouble cooling down because they just don't have the response mechanisms in place to manage manage their body systems very well. Thyroid hormone is also really important for tissue growth and development, particularly skeletal development and neurological development. And this happens in the early years. So uh, one of the things that, that, we current, that currently medicine looks at in the developing um, baby and, and child is ensuring that these children have ample levels of thyroid hormone because without them, the child is not going to meet uh, growth requirements. Um, they'll be short of stature and there'll be some characteristic um, qualities to their body that are indicative of, of a child that is um, uh, deficient in growth hormone. And there's going to be neurological impairment as a result as well. And um, it can also cause problems with reproduction, reproductive capabilities because it seems to have um, some overlap um, in estrogen and testosterone productions. Uh, thyroid hormone also helps maintain blood pressure. It also helps the heartbeat, which helps maintain blood pressure. So how do we make thyroid hormone? Well, we start off with this protein called thyroglobin. And that gets made and uh, moved into the follicle. That, we're that we talked about, the thyroid follicles. And then from the bloodstream, we pull out iodine. Now, usually iodine is floating around the universe in its uh, ion form, which means it has a negative charge. It has an extra electron. That's where it gets that, that negative charge from. So we pull that out of the blood and we shuttle that into the follicle as well. Now, once iodine is in the follicle, we add, uh, we take away an electron and turn it back to its un uh, uncharged state. And uh, in order for it to be stable, it actually binds up with a, a second iodine. That's why you see that, that iodine molecule right here, that I2. That's what that means. The next thing we do is we take that iodine molecule and we attach it to an amino acid called tyrosine. And this is done through enzymes. Now, once we've attached the iodine and the tyrosines together, we'll link those in order to form T3 or T4.
Now, the T3 and the T4 are going to be attached at some point to the, those thyroglobin molecules that we talked about. And then all of that, those T3s, T4s, and the thyroglobins are attached to, they're all going to be captured in a vesicle and moved out of the follicle and into um, the cell that lines the follicle. And once that follicle is inside the cell, there's going to be another vesicle that merges with it that has some lysosomes in there, little enzymes. And those enzymes are going to uh, detach the T3 and T4 from the thyroglobin. OK, let me get you oriented to this picture. So what we see here is that we're looking at a, a follicle in the thyroid, and it's surrounded by these uh, follicular cells. And then in the middle here, we have colloid. And then here's a blood vessel that's going to supply some things that are needed as part of this function. So here's our blood vessel. Here's the follicular cells on the outside of the follicle. And then here is the inside of the follicle with colloid. All right. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to make that thyroglobin that we talked about, that protein. And that happens over here in the endoplasmic reticulum, because this is where our, our ribosomes are. So this is going to be rough endoplasmic reticulum making this thyroglobin. And like most things that, the, that are made over here in the endoplasmic reticulum, it gets shuttled over to the Golgi apparatus, which is going to put it in a vesicle. And now this vesicle is going to get uh, moved to the cell membrane, and then the contents are going to be released into the colloid. So what do we have being released? It's basically that thyroglobin protein that we talked about. Now, one of the features that's going to be in here, one of the structures that we're interested in, is this amino acid called tyrosine. Because tyrosine is going to be what iodine attaches to. So where is our iodine coming from? Well, it's coming from the blood. Now, Iodine floats around in the universe as an iodide, which is a negatively charged uh, atom, an ion in essence. And what, what the body does with this, what's happening here in the thyroid, is that we capture some of that, that, I, that iodide and we shuttle it into the uh, colloid. And then we take away that, that electron, and that's going to cause two iodines to come together and create an iodine molecule. That works out OK, because you know we're going to either have um, you know, three or four iodines attached to our tyrosine, because that's, that's how you make T3 and T4. So that's what we do, is we take these iodines that we're, we're um, taking the uh, electrons away from, and then we're going to attach them to the tyrosine that's part of our thyroglobin. Now, once we make a bunch of this, these follicular cells are going to recognize that. And so they're going to reach up and capture some of that, along with the colloid uh, fluid, and then bring it inside of the uh, follicular cell. And once it's inside the cell, this little vesicle that contains this thyroglobin with the uh, iodine bound to the tyrosine, it's going to merge with this lysosome. Now, in this lysosome are some enzymes that are going to cause the um, tyrosine iodine complex to detach from the rest of the thyroglobin molecule, leaving uh, just the T3 and the T4. And that T3 and T4 is what's going to be what enters the bloodstream. So that's how that's made. So if I had to say it again, I would say we make thyroglobin, which has this tyrosine, that's an amino acid that we're interested in. Um, and then we bring in some iodine, and we attach the iodine to the tyrosine. And then we move it back through the follicular cell and pry it away from the thyroglobin. And then we've got that leaves us with T3 and T4. And that enters the bloodstream, and off we go. Now, both T3 and T4 can bind to receptors, but T3 is really the more biologically active of the two. Um, and out in the tissues, uh, there are enzymes that the cells are going to use to cleave off that fourth iodine and turn T4 into T3. So we're re there we're, um, the cells are going to be, be removing that one iodine to make um, the hormone much more potent. The release of thyroid hormone is going to be regulated by negative feedback loops. So once the, the blood levels of thyroid hormones start to decrease, then that's going to be a trigger for the hypothalamus.
to uh, stimulate the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, rising thyroid hormone levels are going to provide that negative feedback to stop the stimulation of TSH. But TSH can also be inhibited by growth hormone inhibiting hormone. And it can be increased by cortisol, which comes from the adrenal cortex, as well as blood levels of iodine. So there's that. Now, it is possible that uh, the hypothalamus can uh, override any sort of negative feedback, and this does happen during pregnancy. Um, it can also happen during exposure to cold, um, and it's speculated that it, this has something to do with helping infants um, survive really cold uh, um, uh, like a cold exposure like you know you hear the stories about about children or, or young children that get exposed to icy waters and then seem to miraculously survive well we think it has something to, something to do along these lines where the, um, the the hypothalamus is detecting that there's a problem and it just overrides all of the mechanisms causes an abundant abundant release of uh, TSH which stimulates um, uh, thyroid hormone, which then helps maintain metabolic function, even though we don't have appropriate temperature levels to do that. Now, calcitonin is the other hormone that the thyroid makes, and is, this is made by the parafollicular cells. And the job of calcitonin is to put calcium in the bones. I like to think of it like this. Calcitonin tones the bones, makes them strong. Now, because it's adding calcium to the bone, we tend to think of it as an antagonist to parathyroid hormone, because you remember parathyroid hormone uh, pulls calcium out of the bones. Now we've talked about parathyroid uh, hormone and the parathyroid gland already because we, we use the parathyroid gland and the parathyroid hormone that it produces as an example of humoral stimulation um, in that the parathyroid is always watching blood calcium levels and when those calcium levels drop too low, it causes the release of parathyroid hormone. Now, when we think about parathyroid hormone, the targets are going to be skeletal, um, be the skeleton, because it's going to trigger the osteoclast to break down bone in order to release calcium into the bloodstream. Now, parathyroid hormone also goes to the kidneys, and what it's going to do there is it's going to go to the kidneys and say, hey, do you have any calcium in that filtrate that's about to become urine? Because we could really use it. Can I have it? And it'll pull calcium out of filtrate that's destined to become urine and put it back into the bloodstream. The other thing that parathyroid hormone does is it goes down to the intestines and it says, hey, do you happen to have any calcium in that food stuff that you're moving through there? Because we sure could use it right about now. And so it'll cause um, uh, calcium to be pulled out of the intestines as well. So, so let me orient you to this picture. What you're looking at here is the back side of the thyroid gland right here. And here's the trachea, because remember the thyroid, horm the thyroid gland sits in front of the trachea and it kind of wraps around it. And so here we get to actually see these uh, four yellow dots, which are uh, supposed to be the parathyroid glands. And that's where they sit on the back side of the thyroid. Now, like I said, the parathyroid gland is going to release the hormone, parathyroid hormone, and it's going to stimulate the osteoclast in the bones to break down bone and release calcium into the blood, and that'll help elevate blood calcium levels. The other thing that parathyroid hormone is going to do is it's going to cause um, calcium as well, uh, a calcium to be taken up uh, from the kidneys and um, 
enter that back into the bloodstream so that we can elevate blood levels that way. The third thing that it's going to do is that it's actually going to cause the kidneys to activate vitamin D. And then vitamin D is what's going to be uh, what goes to the, the intestines and helps with the absorption of calcium from the intestinal lining. All right, let's talk about the adrenal glands. Now, I've hinted at some things about the adrenal glands, um, and they're pretty complex because we have three different steroids being produced by this gland. So let's talk about the gland. So um, adrenal glands are kind of uh, pyramidal-shaped organs. They sit on top of the kidneys. Um, they're also referred to as the suprarenal glands because they're on top of the renals, the kidneys, um, hence the name uh, suprarenal or adrenal. Um, structurally and functionally, the adrenal glands are two glands in one, very similar to the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary, one gland, uh, but two glands in one. The adrenal cortex is, um, is different uh, in that it is glandular tissue, um, and the medulla is more nervous tissue. And the adrenal cortex actually has three distinct layers of glandular tissue, and as a result, it's making three different hormones. They all three happen to be steroids. Now, there, there's three classifications. I know I said three different steroids, but there's three different classification um, of steroids that are produced by the uh, adrenal cortex. They're listed right here. The mineralocorticoids, which are produced by the outermost layer known as the zona glomerulosa, and then the glucocorticoids, which are produced by the middle layer called the zona fasciculata, and then there's the zona reticularis, which is the innermost layer, and it's producing gonadocorticoids. Now, within these three classifications, there are over 24 different hormones that are being made. You don't have to know all 24. You just have to have a general idea of what some of these are doing. There are a couple that we want you to know, and we're about to go into those. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about what it is we have going on here and where these various hormones are produced. So what we're looking at are the layers uh, of the adrenal gland. So we have an outer capsule. An outer covering, and then this outer layer is the zona glomerulosa, and this is producing the mineralocorticoid called aldosterone. This helps us manage sodium, which helps us manage water volume in the body. The next layer is called the zona fasciculata, and uh, it's producing cortisol, which is a glucocorticoid. It helps us manage blood sugars under in stressful times. Now, this inner layer right here, the innermost layer, the zona reticularis, is producing androgens. Now, androgens are precursors to testosterone. And uh, both males and females use testosterone. Um, males use testosterone. Most, that's, that's basically what they use um, for sperm development, the development of secondary sex characteristics, things like uh, uh, skeletal development, uh, skeletal muscle development, hair growth, uh, lowering of the voice, all those sorts of things. And women also use um, testosterone. It's, um, it's important for libido in women. It's also important for libido in men, but it's important for libido in women. So we've, I've just introduced you to uh, the two hormones that we really want you to know something about, uh, aldosterone and cortisol. Aldosterone is the mineralocorticoid, and uh, cortisol is the glucocorticoid. Now, the mineralocorticoids are going to be responsible for regulating electrolyte concentrations. Primarily, what we're thinking about here is sodium and potassium. Now, why do we call them mineralocorticoids? Because sodium and potassium are minerals. That's why. <laughs> now, like I said earlier, we use um, aldosterone specifically to regulate sodium levels because in the body, um, sodium, 
gets shuttled, it gets moved around, and water follows sodium. So when when Mother Nature wants to move water to an area, she doesn't move water directly there. She moves sodium there, knowing full well that water's going to go with it. So this is this is how that system works. So when we say that uh, the importance of sodium is that it affects extracellular fluid volume, uh, what we really mean is blood volume, uh, and consequently blood pressure as a result of that. Now, other things that are being uh, being manipulated are going to include um, potassium levels in particular, but we can also have um, hydrogen ions uh, affected uh, by mineral uh, corticoids, as well as our bicarbonate ions and our chloride ions. Now, certainly sodium is important because of its effect on fluids, but potassium is also going to be really important for us to regulate. And the reason why this is important is because it sets the resting membrane, membrane potential of cells. And this becomes really important when we are thinking about the resting membrane potential of cardiac cells. So we don't want too much potassium floating around because it can alter the resting membrane potential of heart cells and cause the heart to do some odd things like stop. <laughs> we don't want that. So that's a little bit about that. Now aldosterone, like I said, is the one we want you to know about. It's the mineral corticoid that we want you to know something about. And it's the job of aldosterone to cause the kidneys to uh, release sodium so that sodium can enter the bloodstream knowing full and well that water is going to follow it. So when we, when we notice that we have a low blood pressure, the body interprets that to mean that we also have low blood volume and that's what's causing the low blood pressure. So we release aldosterone, aldosterone goes into the kidneys, pulls out sodium which is also going to pull out fluid, puts it back into the bloodstream and we increase our blood volume. Now the other thing that's happening here is that when we pull one positively charged particle out um, of a place or put it into a place, we need to move another positively charged particle in the opposite direction. So if we're moving positively charged sodium back into the body, for example, we need to move another positively charged particle out of the body. And the positively charged particle that gets moved out is potassium. So we could think of aldosterone as responsible for moving potassium out of the body. So in addition to blood pressure issues, if we have elevated levels of potassium, that could also trigger the release of aldosterone because the body is saying, hey, wait a minute, not only might we have an issue with blood volume, we've got a potassium problem as well. So we can kill two birds with one stone. We can release aldosterone and we can get some uh, blood volume back in here and I get to offload some of my, uh, my potassium as well. Good deal. So there's two stimuli for the release of aldosterone that are particularly important to know about. Now fortunately the effects of aldosterone are short-lived because the, uh, the uh, hormone gets degraded. Um, and uh, there, which I, get, I suppose is a good thing because there's a number of ways that we can affect the release of aldosterone. Uh, one of them comes from the kidneys um, and is under the influence of a hormone called renin. And that's what we see here, the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. We're going to talk about that in the next few slides. Uh, blood plasma concentrations of potassium. We've been talking about that. That's a trigger for the release of aldosterone. Certainly the secretion of ACTH by anterior pituitary is a release, um, is a trigger mechanism for the release of aldosterone because it, it triggers the uh, adrenal cortex to release those hormones. And then we have this one, the atrial natriuretic peptide. As the word atria, atrial indicates, this is coming from the heart. So let's take a look at the angio, at the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. Let's take a look at that. Now, as I've already said, Mother Nature tends to really like these bureaucratic processes. And the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism is a rather bureaucratic process. So let's, let's talk about the steps that are involved with this. So uh, the kidneys are filtering blood and the kidneys are particularly sensitive to blood pressure. Um, 
the kidneys don't like for there to be really high blood pressure because that can actually damage the delicate tissues that are doing filtration. But they want a sustained amount of blood pressure. So they're particularly sensitive to drops in blood pressure. And when the kidneys detect that there's a, uh, a drop in blood pressure, um, it's going to create a problem with filtrate um, creation and the kidneys really don't like that because that, that too can create damage to the, the filtering mechanism. So the kidneys will release a hormone called renin when it detects a drop in blood pressure. And renin will enter into the bloodstream and um, it's going to look for this uh, plasma protein called angiotensinogen. This is made by the liver. And this is one of those chemicals that's almost ready to go. It needs a little bit of work being done on it. Kind of like T4, uh, released by the thyroid hormone, by, released by the thyroid, the hormone that's almost ready to go. Well, this is a hormone that's almost ready to go. So what happens is uh, kidney releases renin into the bloodstream. Renin seeks out this uh, angiotensinogen and it cleaves off part of it. It's not ready to go yet. When renin cleaves off part of it, we call it angiotensin 1. So it goes from being angiotensinogen to an angiotensin 1. Now this will make its way over to the lungs where there's another enzyme that says, oh looky here, I have some angiotensin 1. That means that it's my job now to cleave off the rest of it and make angiotensin 2, which it does. Now we have the active form of angiotensin, angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is then going to go to the brain and it's going to trigger the brain to release um, corticotropic releasing hormone and which is going to trigger the release of ACTH which is going to trigger the release of aldosterone. Now the way the body handles uh, potassium is a little bit different. Um, tissue level of potassium in the adrenal cortex can be the trigger for the release of aldosterone. So we're not waiting for the brain to uh, release corticotropic releasing hormone. We're not waiting around for anterior pituitary to release ACTH. The, the adrenal gland can actually detect that there is a problem with potassium levels in the blood and release aldosterone on its own. And that's how um, <laughs> That's kind of an unusual mechanism because we don't see that with any other mineral other than potassium. So potassium basically has a way to um, be regulated at the tissue level, which is kind of unusual. Um, let's see, ACTH can cause small increases of aldosterone during periods of increased stress. We would expect that because it targets the adrenal cortex. Um, now, we mentioned this one here, the atrial natriuretic peptide. Um, this is secreted by the heart in response to high blood pressure. Now, we haven't studied the heart yet, but hopefully you know that the atria are the two upper chambers and they're going to receive blood from the body um, or from the lungs. Now, if when it receives blood, if there's any additional stretch put on the atria, they perceive that as a little bit of a problem. And they send, uh, they release a hormone as a response to that. And then that's going to uh, go to the kidneys and it's actually going to block the release of renin from the kidneys, which will ultimately block the release of, aldos of, of uh, aldosterone. And uh, it will also block the release of aldosterone secretion and um, which is going to cause blood pressure to decrease over time because we're not pulling fluids out of filtrate at the kidney level. Now everything that we've talked about so far has been about increasing blood pressure. Um, atrial, atrial natriuretic peptide is the only hormone that we've talked about that actually um, increases blood pressure. Everything else that we've talked about is, uh, is all about lowering blood pressure. Now what about these glucocorticoids? Well, they're going to influence metabolism of most cells and help resist stressors. They're going to keep uh, blood glucose levels um, fairly constant and um, they're going to help maintain blood pressure by increasing uh, vasoconstriction in, within the blood vessels. Now, uh, glucocorticoids are good things to have around. Um, 
cortisol is the one that is present in humans. Uh, um, there are other ones, but this is the big one. Uh, when we when we tend to think of glucocorticoids, we're we're kind of um, thinking cortisol. Cortisol. Now, we love cortisol. It does a lot of good stuff for us. But if we have it around too much, then we start to see bad effects. Now, cortisol can be released cyclically. Like I said earlier, when we were talking about um, the influences of AC, uh, ACTH release, um, that it has to do with normal physiological cycles that occur throughout the day, um, cortisol can be, can be affected that way as well. So cortisol secretions are, are, are governed by patterns of eating as well as activity. So normal eating patterns, normal activity can normalize the secretion of cortisol. Now, if you have acute stress, such as an infection if you're sick, or if you have physical stress like an injury or emotional stress, which could be any number of things, that can interrupt the normal cortisol rhythm that we see. And people who are in long-term stress are going to have uh, high levels of cortisol showing up at inappropriate times. And uh, if you're in a high state of stress, like a sympathetic um, state, the, then the central nervous system can override cortisol inhibition of ACTH and cort uh, corticotropic releasing hormone, um, leading to more cortisol secretion. And that's actually a bad thing. Cortisol is good, but too much is a bad thing. Now, cortisol increases um, uh, uh, blood glucose levels as well as those fatty acids and amino acids, and all those things are, are geared towards uh, stimulating cells to produce energy, um, use fatty acids for fuel, and to do protein synthesis. And that's normally good stuff. Um, uh, it, it causes the cells to do what's called gluconeogenesis, which is to form glucose from fats and proteins. So I'm, I alluded to that earlier. I said that some, that most tissues can use fats and proteins as fuel sources, and that's actually good because that helps us maintain our weight. But um, the problem gets to be that if you have cortisol being dumped into the body all the time, now you've got elevated uh, levels of glucose being circulated all the time, which means now you're depositing it. Uh, you can't use it all, so you're going to deposit it as fat. So high levels of, of uh, cortisol can actually lead to fat deposition, um, which can be a side effect of stress. Not good. Uh, another fa uh, function of cortisol is that it can enhance vasoconstriction, which will help increase blood pressure rather quickly. Uh, and this helps distrib distribute nutrients throughout the cells. If you have cortisol levels uh, existing long term, look at what it's doing. It's causing vasoconstriction, which can increase your blood pressure long term, which could be problematic. So you're starting to see that although many of these things can be good initially, if you leave them in place long term, they can actually end up being bad things. So in addition to all the other things that I said that could be bad if you left, is, left cortisol in place for too long, is that uh, it can depress cartilage and bone formation. That's pretty bad stuff. It can inhibit the inflammatory responses and decrease um, inflammatory chemicals, which means that now you have decreased capacity to recover from injury. That's a problem. It can also suppress the immune response, which means that you get colds easier. You can get sick easier. It can also disrupt normal cardiovascular, neural, and gastrointestinal functions. So having excessive levels of cortisol around, really bad. <laughs> so let's, let's think about this. So let's say that you're stuck at home because there's a pandemic. All right, guess what's happening to your cortisol levels? Yeah, they've increased because you're stressed. They've increased because you're not getting up and moving around because um, activity helps normalize cortisol levels. Um, you're probably eating more, which is now stimulating more cortisol. So the best thing you can absolutely do for yourself is get out, move around, have a, a, a normal uh, eating plan, steady eating plan, and um, air, air quotes, burn off the, the cortisol with daily activity 
and a little bit of exercise. It's the best thing you can do for yourself. Now the gonadocorticoids are also called the adrenal sex hormones. They're weak androgens. They're basically the precursors to male, to male sex hormones. They get converted into testosterone in the body tissues. Uh, and women's bodies are great about taking testosterone and then just turning it into more estrogen. Um, but women's bodies do also use uh, a little bit of testosterone. Like I said, it's important for libido. Now, um, we think that these uh, adrenal sex hormones um, contribute to the onset of puberty and uh, as well as the appearance of the secondary sex characteristics. Uh, so I alluded earlier that it can take a number of years after we start to see the release of the gonadotropic releasing hormones coming from the hypothalamus. It can take a few years before the, the gonads actually get normalized and function properly. So there's some idea that um, the androgens being released from the adrenal glands are what's triggering and maintaining the um, secondary sex characteristics, at least initially, while the gonads are, are kind of gearing up and figuring things out. Uh, like I said, the adrenal sex hormones are responsible for the sex drive in women. And it can also serve as a source of estrogens once women go through menopause because the ovaries are not producing estrogen like they used to. So uh, that means now that these uh, adrenal sex hormones, although there's not very many of them, they, they become an important source of estrogens for women. Not the right estrogens, but at least some estrogens. Now the adrenal medulla has these um, cells called chromaffin cells that are responsible for making the catecholamines. And the catecholamines are the adrenaline, noradrenaline, also known as epinephrine, norepinephrine. Now what is the effect of these catecholamines? Well this is part of the sympathetic fight or flight response. So we're going to see vasoconstriction, but we're not going to see vasoconstriction throughout the body. We're just going to see vasoconstriction happening in the uh, organs that are not necessary for fight or flight, like the digestive organs. Uh, we're going to see an increased heart rate so that our blood gets moving and we can move oxygen and nutrients out to those muscles that are going to help us either flee or fight. Uh, we're going to see an increase in blood glucose levels and blood's going to be diverted to the brain, the heart, and the skeletal muscle. All that's designed to help us uh, run or fight, depending on what we're doing as part of that sympathetic response. Now both of the catecholamines are going to have uh, the same basic effects, except that uh, epinephrine is going to be more of a stimulator to metabolic activities, and norepinephrine is going to be more of an influence on uh, vasoconstriction and blood pressure. It's going to have more of an effect on blood pressure. Now um, the responses to these stressors, so the actions of epinephrine and norepinephrine are going to be fairly brief, which is unlike the actions of the hormones coming from the adrenal cortex. Those, ha those have a tendency to be longer lasting. Now, epinephrine and norepinephrine are protein-based hormones, and hormones that are made in the adrenal cortex are steroids. Just thought I would share that. The pancreas is going to be found behind the stomach. And this gland is really interesting because it has both exocrine function and endocrine function. Now, when we're thinking about the exocrine function, we're thinking about the production of those um, digestive enzymes. Those are being made by cells called acinar cells. Now, when we think about endocrine functions, we have several cells that we could be thinking about. Um, two of them are the alpha cells and the beta cells. And these are located um, in what we call islets of Langerhans or pancreatic islets. The alpha cells are going to be responsible for, for producing a hormone called glucagon. And the beta cells are responsible for producing a hormone called insulin. Now here we're seeing a slide of some pancreatic tissue. And we can see that there's a distinct structure right here. This would be an islet of Langerhans or pancreatic islet, and we can see some um, alpha cells here, and then we can see some beta cells hanging out over here. Oh, and look, we can even see some ACE in our cells. These are making pancreatic 
juices. This is exocrine. This is endocrine. These will be released into the lumen of the intestinal tract by way of a duct. These hormones will be released directly into the bloodstream. Now, glucagon is a hormone that is going to um, cause the body to release its stored glucose. Yes, we actually store glucose. So how does that happen? Well, let's say that you eat a big sugary meal. One of the things that's going to happen is that insulin is going to be um, released from the beta cells. That's who makes it. And it's going to help sweep that glucose into the cells. Now, the liver is also paying attention to what's happening. The liver and skeletal muscle are also paying attention. And they, too, are detecting these high levels of glucose. So that's going to trigger these high levels of glucose. are going to say, well, it's going to trigger the liver to say, well, look at that. There's enough there that I can actually tuck away some for about 3 o'clock this afternoon when I know that uh, it's going to be snack time and we're, not, we're going to be too busy to eat anything. And I don't want blood sugar to drop too low. So uh, body tissues will figure this out and it'll start to pull glucose out of circulation and knit them together into these long chains that we call glycogen. And then it gets stored. And the way we access those stores is by releasing glucagon. So the way glucagon gets released, the trigger is decreased blood glucose levels, as well as rising amino acid levels, or possibly even sympathetic nervous system input. But typically, it's once our glucose levels tend to start to drop, the body recognizes this, the brain's screaming for glucose. So uh, we see the, um, the alpha cells releasing glucagon, and that taps into our stored glucose uh, level, uh, glucose stores, and then blood level comes back up with glucose, and we're, we're good for a while until we can get around to eating a meal. All right, so it, this is explaining it right here. So glucagon is going to target the liver to break down glycogen into glucose. Um, it's going to synthesize glucose from lactic acid, uh, which is a byproduct of anaerobic um, uh, metabolism and other non-carbohydrates, and then it's going to cause the release of glucose into the blood. Thank you, glucagon. Now, insulin is going to be released once the pancreas detects that there is a lot of circulating glucose in the blood. Now, um, initially it gets released as pro-insulin, and then it gets modified. So, yeah, what does that sound like? Sounds like some other things we talked about where you have a uh, molecule being released and it's almost ready to be released form, uh, almost active form, and then something that has to happen in order for it to get triggered uh, into being released. Uh, we're not going to talk about the details of that, but that's, that's actually how that happens. So what is it that insulin is actually doing for us? Well, it's going to enhance membrane transport of glucose in, uh, into fat and muscle cells. So glucose can't just go up to a cell and say, hey, look, it's me. I'm ready to come in. It needs an escort, and that's what insulin's doing for it. It's basically uh, you know, going, going there and knocking on the door of the cell for glucose and then uh, getting that door open and allowing glucose to go in. Um, it's going to inhibit the breakdown of glycogen to glucose, so it's going to be somewhat protective of our, of our stores of, of sugar. Then it's going to inhibit the conversion of amino acids or fats into glucose. So it's um, it's once we have insulin being released, it's basically saying, hey, everything can stop. We've got plenty of glucose right here. So uh, everybody just sit tight. Let's get some glucose into the cells, and then we'll then we'll figure out what needs to happen. That's basically the effect of insulin. Although most cells need uh, insulin to get glucose into the cells. This is not true for the brain. Because like I said, the brain only works on glucose. Glucose just slips right into the brain and then off we go. Um, the liver, because like I said, the liver is uh, the organ, a big organ, that is all about looking at glucose and pulling it out if it needs to or if it can in order to make stores of it. Um, and the kidney. So. Um, these three organs do not need to have glu uh, insulin present in order to move glucose out of the bloodstream. Uh, insulin plays a role in uh, neuronal development, learning, and memory. So we need to make sure we have circulating levels of that uh, as necessary when we're developing. Um, 
Um, it's, uh, it binds to tyrosine kinase enzyme receptors that triggers the cell to increase glucose uptake. And it can also trigger cells to catalyze um, oxidation of glucose for ATP production, making it the first priority. And it can also cause glucose to form glycogen. And it can convert glucose to fat. So what influences insulin release? Well, elevated blood glucose levels certainly are their primary stimulus for the release of insulin. Rising blood levels of amino acid and fatty acids are also stimula stimulations for the release of insulin. Um, the release of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine by the parasympathetic nerve, nerve fibers, that can trigger insulin. The presence of the hormones glucagon, epinephrine, growth hormone, thyroxine, and glucocorticoids or cortisol will also trigger the release of insulin because all of these are tied with glucose. Now what's going to inhibit the release of insulin? Well, a, a hormone called somatostatin can trigger the release, uh, uh, can trigger the inhibition of the release of insulin. And this is actually produced by another cell that's located next door to the uh, beta cells called a delta cell, also in the pancreas. So delta cells can release um, a, a somatostatin that causes the uh, beta cells to stop the production of insulin. That's, that's actually a paracrine um, function. Because uh, it's like not making it for me, but I'm making it for you, you right there. Uh, sympathetic nervous system can also inhibit insulin release. So, so this are some um, some influences on insulin. So we see our little teeter totter here. That's a good indication that what we're talking about is a negative feedback mechanism. So if we look at what's happening here, let's say that we have increased blood sugars as our stimulus. Going to go to the pancreas. Pancreas is going to release insulin, which will uh, cause the cells to uptake glucose. And it can stimulate glucagon, uh, glycogen, excuse me, glycogen formation by the liver because remember the liver is going to take up glucose. doesn't need uh, insulin to do that. And as cells in the liver start to take up glucose, then blood glucose levels start to fall and return to normal. And then that basically stops the, uh, the release of insulin from the pancreas. Now what if we have decreasing blood glucose levels? Well, that's going to go to the pancreas um, and it's going to cause the release of glucagon. It's going to go to the uh, liver among other tissues, cause the release of, of uh, glucose from glycogen. Blood glucose levels will rise and then we'll have restoration back to normal. And then once uh, blood levels return to normal, then we stop the stimulus. Classic negative feedback. Now the gonads are going to be the structures that are going to be producing the sex hormones, estrogens and testosterones. The adrenal cortex makes some of these hormones, but the gonads make a lot more. Now when we talk about gonads, we're talking about the ovaries in women and we're talking about the testes in, in men. Now the gonads are regulated by the gonadotropins, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, which are released by the anterior pituitary. So the ovaries are going to produce estrogens and progesterone. Now estrogen, what's that doing for us? Well, it's causing the maturation of the reproductive organs. Um, that's at the onset of puberty. Uh, it'll also cause the appearance of secondary sexual characteristics. And along with progesterone, it's going to cause breast development and create the female um, uterine and uh, uh, ovary cycles that lead to uh, productive viability. Now, if there should be a placenta present, the placenta is also going to secrete estrogens, progesterone, as well as another hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin. Now, in the males, we, we're going to have the, the testes, and the testes produce testosterone. 
Now, what's testosterone doing? Well, it's initiating the maturation of the male reproductive organs. It's causing the appearance of secondary uh, sex characteristics as well as um, creating sex drive. It's necessary for normal sperm production, and it helps maintain uh, reproductive organs in the functional state. And in the case of the males, that's going to be for the entirety of his life. Now, it's possible that there's going to be interactions between hormones. And I've actually alluded to some of them already, and it, we'll revisit those examples as we go through here. Um, so multiple hormones can act on the same target at the same time, but they might not necessarily have the same effect. So for example, you could have one hormone, one hormone encouraging something and another hormone discouraging something. That would be an example of um, a, an antagonistic effect or uh, antagonism. This is where you have one or more hormones opposing the action of another hormone. So an example of that would be insulin and uh, glucagon. So insulin is all about decreasing blood glucose levels, whereas glucagon is about increasing blood glucose levels. Another example of this that we talked about earlier was parathyroid hormone and, cal and uh, calcitonin. Parathyroid hormone is about increasing blood uh, calcium levels and calcitonin will decrease blood calcium levels. Then we have synergism. This is when one or more hormones produces the same effect on a target cell, causing amplification. Um, so examples of this are glucagon and epinephrine. Both of these hormones are going to cause the liver to release glucose. So that's an example of synergism. Sometimes one hormone can't exert its efforts without the presence of another hormone, and that is an example of permissivism. That's what we call permissivism. Um, reproductive hormones need thyroid hormone in order to be effective. So this is why without thyroid hormone, you likely don't have reproductive viability. It's because thyroid hormone has a, per, uh, um, has a permissive effect. On reproductive hormones. Then we have uh, hormones that are considered integrative, which it means that you have hormones that have different effect, but basically the effects are complementary. Perfect example of that is prolactin and oxytocin. If we wanted to deliver milk to the baby, we have to have prolactin produce it and oxytocin release it. So in this section of the lecture, um, I give you just a real simple once over about these homeostatic imbalances. Um, just enough to kind of get you going. If you have questions, because you might have questions, uh, I'd recommend that this is where you do some additional outside reading on some of these topics. So I'll give you the once over, um, but I would encourage, like I said, encourage you to read some more about it. So diabetes, we have a couple of different types of diabetes. We have um, diabetes type 1 and diabetes type 2. Type 1 is when you have uh, low secretion of insulin, and type 2 is when you have um, low activity of insulin. So we could almost think of um, type 1 being an inability to uh, make insulin and type 2 is like we're making insulin but the body's just not able to to take it up because we basically burned out our receptors for it. So what happens is that when blood glucose levels um, when you don't have insulin functionality or you don't have insulin present then blood glucose levels remain high. And the effects of this, that this has on the person is that they can feel nauseated and um, it can lead to basically a sympathetic response like that fight or flight response which can uh, further increase blood glucose levels and now you're into a bad, a bad situation. Uh, if you have diabetes, um, typically what you're going to end up with um, is excess glucose in the urine and this is called glucoseuria. Uh, three cardinal signs of diabetes are 
um, polyuria, which means that you're putting out a lot of urine. Um, and that's part be, in part because glucose acts as an uh, osmotic diuretic. Uh, it means that when we move glucose into the filtrate, water is going to follow it. That's what's happening there. We have polydipsia, which is an excessive thirst. And this is because we've got all that water loss happening due to polyuria. And then the third one is called polyphagia, which is excessive hunger um, and food consumption. And the reason why you have this is because basically the cells, are, the cells are starving. They're not able to take up glucose, even though there's plenty of it floating around. Without insulin being there to escort the glucose into the cells, the cells are starving. So when sugars can't be used as fuel because we don't have insulin to move uh, glucose into the cells, then fats are used. And this causes something called lipidemia. Lipid meaning fats and emia having to do with the blood. So we're going to have high levels of fats in the blood. Now, fatty acid metabolism results in the formation of these molecules called ketones or ketone bodies. And ketones are acidic in nature. And when we have enough of these in the blood, we have a condition called ketoacidosis. Or um, keto, we can also have keto, uh, ketonuria, which means that we have these ketones in the body. Um, when people were doing first doing the Atkins diet a number of years ago, um, pharmacies were selling these um, these urinary sticks that could test to see if you had uh, keto, ketonuria. And if you did, then that was an indication that you were burning your fat. So that, just as an aside about that. The problem is, is that if you have ketoacidosis, um, it can create problems. The body doesn't like to be acidic. Um, and that can lead to something called hypernia, which is uh, rapid breathing. This can lead to um, disrupted heart activity and uh, issues with oxygen transport and uh, can severely depress the nervous system and might even lead to coma and death. Basically, you're becoming too acidic. You're, you've got a form of acidosis. The body really, really doesn't like that. There's another form of diabetes called di diabetes insipidus, which is due to ADH deficiency. And it's typically uh, a result of some sort of damage to the hypothalamus or the posterior pituitary. And what happens here is that you, you're not making ADH, you're not releasing ADH. So you don't have that antidiuretic effect, which means that you're losing all of your fluids. So if this is a, a, a scenario with a patient, then it's going to be the patient's job to make sure they're always well hydrated. That's how that's managed. There's also another condition called symptom uh, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, uh, which uh, is the retention of fluid, uh, which can lead to headache and disorientation. Um, and this is because you have uh, over secreted ADH, basically. Um, if this is happening, then what you do is just the opposite. Instead of drinking a lot of fluid, you have to actually restrict your fluids. And you also have to monitor blood sodium levels because remember, wherever sodium goes, fluid goes. And if you're already hanging, to, hanging on to all your fluids, you don't want to hang on to any more because you ate a bunch of salty potato chips. Now, there's uh, also growth hormone disorders. Hypersecretion of growth hormone um, is usually caused by some sort of a tumor on the anterior pituitary. Now, if we have this hypersecretion occurring in children, this is going to lead to something. This is going to lead to something called gigantism. Um, this is this is those children that just keep growing and growing and growing. These people can get to be over eight feet tall, and this person is going to basically look normal. They're going to have fairly normal proportions. They're just going to be excessively tall. Um, now, there's always problems with that. There's uh, issues with the knees and, and uh, weight bearing because structurally, we're just not meant to handle that kind of weight. Um, but you know, depending upon how that all works out, um, uh, some, some of those people end up doing just fine. Now, if you have growth hormone, that uh, excessive growth hormone secretion that occurs in adults after the growth plates have 
uh, sealed up. Then you have a condition that's called agromegaly. And what happens here is that instead of continuing to get really tall, you can't do that because, like I said, those growth plates are closed. What ends up happening is that you're going to see the bones in the hands and the feet continuing to grow as well as in the face. It has a real distinct look to it, and it really changes the way a person looks over time. Now, what happens if you have hyposecretion of growth hormone? Well, if this happens in children, then it leads to something that's called pituitary dwarfism. And this is the person that basically just stops growing at about four feet tall. They're going to be of normal proportion. They'll look, they'll look normal. They're just going to be really, really short. Now, if this happens in adults, there's usually um, not going to be a big problem with that because normally growth hormone levels taper off in adulthood once we've gone through our big growth phase. So in this picture what we see is a normal sized woman. We see a man who is suffering from gigantism and then a man who is suffering from pituitary dwarfism. And you can see both of these individuals are fairly normal in their proportions and in their appearance. It's just that they're either excessively tall or excessively short. Now, thyroid, hor uh, thyroid hormone disorders can go uh, on either end of the spectrum. It could be either producing too much or too little. If you're producing too little, it's classified as a condition of hypothyroidism. So this is low secretion of thyroid hormone. Typically, the symptoms are going to look like um, low metabolic rate, um, thick or dry skin, puffy, puffiness around the eyes, um, problems regulating body temperature, particularly staying warm. Um, it can actually slow down uh, the intestinal function, which can lead to constipation. It can cause fluid retention throughout the body, which looks like edema, including pitting edema in the ankles and the feet. It can lead to mental sluggishness, because remember, thyroid also affects nerve function, and general lethargy which means that you're very sluggish in your mannerisms, in your speech, in your thought. Um, you're just real low energy. Now, there's a, a number of reasons why you might be hypothyroid. If it's due to a lack of iodine, because remember, we need iodine in order to make thyroid hormone, then what typically happens is that you your thyroid gland grows this um, excessive structure called a goiter. And... Um, uh, if you have a lack of iodine, then you're going to see a decrease in thyroid hormone levels because you're not making hormone. You don't have the, the, the goods to make the hormone itself. What that does is it triggers um, the, the anterior pituitary to release more uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, which goes down to the thyroid and basically starts whipping those cells and says, hey, come on, do your job. And the cells are like, I'm trying, I just can't. And in response to all that extra TSH, the thyroid gets really big. So growing uh, uh, this, this mass on the thyroid is not uncommon in hypothyroidism because basically the anterior pituitary is sending out loads of uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, which is whipping up the, the thyroid gland, trying to get it to do something. And in response, it can't. And so it just gets big instead. Now, the other spectrum could be that you're hyperthyroid, which means that you've got an increase of the thyroid hormones. Now, the symptoms here are going to be unintentional weight loss, rapid or irregular heartbeat, nervousness, anxiety, and irritability. You could be shaky, have tremors. You could sweat a lot. You could be um, very sensitive to heat. Um, your hair could be fine and brittle, even your nails. Um, and that's because you've got this thyroid hormone in excess that's just basically whipping cells up into a frenzy, doing all kinds of crazy things. This, too, can also lead to thyroid enlargement because now the, the activity of the thyroid is like supercharged. Got to have big follicles to make all that extra thyroid hormone. 
So this is an image of a woman who has an enlarged thyroid due to iron deficiency. We don't see this so much in America because we put iodine and salt and, and other things, but in third world countries where there isn't that sort of um, mediation, um, you still see goiters due to um, deficient thyroid in the diet, uh, deficient iodine in the diet. Now there are a couple of autoimmune disorders that can affect the thyroid and they'll, they'll have different uh, effects on the thyroid. So for example, Hashimoto's disease, this is going to be, this is going to lead to hyposecretion of thyroid hormone. So what's happening here is that the body is making abnormal antibodies that are destroying the thyroid tissue, making it unable to make thyroid hormone. And the symptoms are going to include the symptoms um, that you would see in, in normal low hypothyroidism. You're going to see low metabolic rate, thick, dry skin, uh, puffy eyes, feeling chilled, constipation, edema, mental sluggishness, lethargy. All of those are going to be the, be the, the same thing. Um, the treatment for this uh, is to supplement. It's, it's going to be the same whether you're um, low thyroid because of, uh, for any reason, your treatment is going to be to uh, supplement with thyroid replacement hormone. Now, Hashimoto's disease also has um, another confounding factor, which is that gluten sensitivity seems to accompany this. And the reason for that is that the thyroid uh, molecules very closely resemble gluten. So if your body has made antibodies against thyroid hormone, then um, you're, or you're gonna have like these, these antibodies kind of floating around. And then if you eat gluten and that makes it into the bloodstream, which it will, now is your body's gonna think that you've got an invasion of these thyroid hormones. And it's gonna make even more antibodies, which is gonna create more of a stress and an attack on your thyroid tissue. So uh, people with Hashimoto's disease, doctors are now recommending to do a low or no gluten diet, uh, gluten-free diet. Uh, in order to keep the production of hormones against the thyroid down to a dull roar. Graves' disease is another autoimmune disorder that affects the thyroid, but in this case, it actually causes hypersecretion of thyroid hormone. Well, how's it doing that? Well, in this uh, scenario, the body is making abnormal antibodies that look a little bit like TSH, they mimic TSH, which is going to stimulate um, thyroid hormone release. So what does this look like? Well, this looks like all of the um, hyperthyroid hormone uh, symptomology that you would see. Elevated metabolic rate, weight loss, sweating, rapid irregular heartbeat, nervousness, um, uh, despite adequate food intake, that sort of thing. Now, with Graves' disease, there's also an additional um, kind of a pathognomonic symptomology that we see, which is called ex ophthalmos, which means the eyes uh, seem to protrude from the eye socket. And the reason why that is that the tissue behind the eye becomes uh, very fluid filled and fibrous. It's just one of the effects of thyroid. Thyroid, uh, thyroid hormone can, uh, when things are off like that, it can lead dep to deposition of all kinds of weird molecules in the tissues and stuff. And um, this is where we see it in Graves' disease. One of the reasons why skin gets thick in hyper hypothyroidism is because of the deposition of um, uh, some random molecules in the, in the body tissues, uh, creating that thick skin. All right, so how do we treat Graves' disease? Well, um, you've got to get rid of that thyroid tissue. That's, 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 your, that's your option. So you can do surgical removal of the thyroid, or you might even do radioactive iodine to destroy, to destroy the active thyroid cells. So here we see a woman who has the bulging eyes that are kind of um, the trademark of Graves' disease. So um, the adrenal cortex can have some disorders too. Uh, Cushing's syndrome or Cushing's disease, they're actually different, um, but they're typically classified together. Uh, it has to do with hypersecretion of cortisol.
So what is that going to do for us? Well, we've kind of talked about some of this. We're going to see um, depression of cortisone and, uh, excuse me, uh, cartilage and bone formation. We're going to see a depression of the immune system. We're going to see inhibition of inflammation, which is going to reduce healing capacity. We're going to have disruptions in neural, cardiovascular, and gastrointestinal function, just like what we would see if we had uh, excessive cortisol production long-term in our own bodies. So what can cause this? Well, it could be a tumor on the pituitary. Uh, it could also be a tumor in the lungs, the pancreas, kidney, or the adrenal cortex. It could also be a result of the overuse of steroids, um, corticosteroids specifically. So what do we look for in this person? There's a couple of uh, pathognomonic cushionoid signs. They're called moon face and buffalo hump. Those are horrible names, I know. What do we mean by moon face? A very round, puffy face that's characteristic of uh, excessive uh, cortisol consumption or steroid consumption. And then uh, the growth of a fat pad at the base of the neck and on in the back um, where the neck meets the shoulders, kind of giving that hump look. So those are the two um, the, the, the two physical features that when you see that in somebody, you're pretty sure that you're looking at some sort of um, hypersecretion of cortisol. So what do you do about it? Well, if there's a tumor, you remove it. And if you're using drugs that are causing it, you discontinue them. So here's what you see in somebody who has Cushing's disease. So here's this woman. I'm sure she was initially diagnosed at this point. And you can see she's got nice uh, cheekbones. You can see her cheekbones here. And she's got a nice neckline back here. But after um, some time, uh, you can see that she's gotten this puffiness to her face. And you can see the growth of that fat pad. Adson's disease is going to be the other end of the spectrum with the adrenal cortex, and that's going to be hyposecretion of cortisol as well as aldosterone. Now, this is going to lead to a decrease in blood glucose levels because cortisol is really good about helping us maintain blood glucose levels. It's also going to really, uh, lead to a decrease in sodium levels. Now, this patient is going to experience weight loss, severe dehydration, and hypotension. And then there's also this characteristic uh, symptom known as the bronzing of the skin. Now, why do we have that? Well, it has to do with um, the effect that ACTH has on melanocytes. Um, there is this, um, this secondary effect that ACTH has on melanocytes, and it causes, uh, which are the cells in the skin that create the brown color to the skin. And um, so this excessive ACTH will trigger melanocytes to become more active. And that's why you see people um, with the darkening skin, in addition to the weight loss, the dehydration. So now you're looking at a uh, um, person with AdSense disease. So how do you treat that? Well, you actually give them the corticosteroid replacements. That's what you do. So here we see a patient upon presentation of Addison's disease, and you can see how dark her skin is. You can see she's super thin, not looking real happy. <laughs> and then you can see after she's been treated um, that her skin has faded and uh, she's put on a little bit of weight and she looks a lot healthier. And with that, we are done.